boilers. Thermodynamics and combustion is our topic for today's webinar. But before we start, I would really like to acknowledge uh, these utilities for making this particular webinar possible. We thank you very much for that. Today's recording covering thermodynamics and combustion in boilers is really intended as a primer for those individuals who may be attending other live or recorded sessions in the future on boilers and related systems and as such desires some basic preparation or instruction in order to make their training more meaningful. So with those thoughts in mind, here is what we will be covering in today's session. I'd like to get into the boiler's place in the overall system, kind of get us in the church before we start going in pews. And then I want to talk about the key thermodynamic laws. Very important that you understand these basics. These are going to be simple. It's not getting into a lot of minutia here. And then I'd like to talk about thermal energy and its meaning. And the methods of heat transfer in boilers. How is that BTU taken from the burner into the water within the boiler? And then typical fuel choices that we use today. Get into the combustion principles. What's really going on within that boiler? What's going on inside that burner? And then, of course, as you have combustion, you have emission considerations that we have to take into consideration today. And then also, I'd like to get into the efficient burner design and emission control. And then at the very end, we'll have a summary, or at least the key takeaways for the day's session. So let's begin by orienting uh, ourselves with the, the boiler and the role it plays in the steam and hot water system. You know, on the screen now, you, you, you see a typical steam system, a boiler room, uh, showing the boiler, which is the heart of the system, and then the ancillary equipment used to support the boiler, such as a water softener, a dealkalizer, deaerator, chemical feed system, and so on. In other words, it's analogous, really, to the human body with various organs working in conjunction with the heart to supply oxygenated blood throughout the body and then returning it through the, the venous system where it is purified and reoxygenated and then the process continues. And so it is with the, the process steam system, with the steam from the boiler going out to the piping network, doing its job, and then returning as condensate and or makeup water and then purified by the pretreatment equipment before returning to the boiler, the heart of the system. And then the cycle continues. And it's the same with a comfort heating hot water system where the, the water is elevated in temperature in the boiler before being pumped through the system's network of radiant heaters, giving up its heat, and then returning through a separate piping system at a much colder temperature, of course. And just like the steam system, the cycle continues. Okay, enough for the orientation. Now, now let's start zeroing in on what really goes on in a boiler and the engineering principles associated with these dynamics. And, and we'll begin with the first law of thermodynamics, the concept that heat can be converted to mechanical power. Just like you see on the screen now with a, a boiler on wheels, the steam locomotive rolling down the track, or the boiler providing steam power to drive a piston for pumping water. Then we have the second law of thermodynamics, which simply states that heat only travels from hot to cold, never the reverse. We can have a refrigeration system or a boiler. The heat always travels from hot to cold. And then we have the concept of thermal energy and heat. What's the difference? Well, thermal energy is not the same as heat. It only means energy in transit, such as with the steam locomotive, where this thermal energy is being harnessed as a motive force. Heat, on the other hand, is energy transferred between substances or systems due to a temperature difference between them. So it, it is correct to say that a system contains thermal energy, but not that it contains heat, since heat means energy that is transferred from one thing to another. Which leads me then to the types of heat generated in a boiler. We have two of them. And we'll begin with the first type called sensible heat. This is the heat the burner supplies which goes into the boiler water to elevate its temperature. But it remains as a liquid. There is no change in state. 
This then is different from the second form of heat, which we refer to as latent heat or latent energy. This form of energy comes into play once the water has reached saturation, meaning it can no longer take any more BTUs or sensible BTUs, or it will experience a phase change going from a liquid to a gas or steam. Steam is a gas. It cannot be seen. The heat energy added at this point of the saturation is called latent energy. Here, let me show you with this steam chart what I mean. Note we have a, a border operating at 100 PSIG, and the temperature of the feed water is 200 degrees. And the saturation of water, or boiling point, at 100 PSIG is 338 degrees Fahrenheit. This means I have to add 138 BTUs to each pound of water to raise the temperature to 338 degrees. One pound of water, one BTU, one degree, because the specific heat of water is one. Now, once I'm at 338 degrees, the water is saturated. And if we want steam at that temperature, 338 degrees, we need to add 880 BTUs to each pound of water in the boiler. And once we've done that, we now have 100 pounds of steam, 338 degrees, because we added the 880 BTUs of latent energy. Now, here's another way to look at this same thing using a steam table. But rather than starting out at 200 degree feed water, let's say we have 32 degree liquid feed water and we want to make zero steam or steam at zero gauge pressure, which at sea level is 14.7 PSIA absolute. In other words, zero gauge pressure is really 14.7 pounds of absolute pressure. And you know water boils at 212 degrees Fahrenheit at sea level. Okay, with those conditions in mind, you need to add 180 BTU to the pound of water to bring it to the boiling point. Remember, we started at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. And if we want to change the state of the water to steam at 212 degrees, we now have to add 970 BTUs to each pound of water. And of course, we are adding latent energy at this point. So in the final analysis, we now have a total enthalpy, or BTU content, in the pound of steam totaling 1,150 BTUs because we added the sensible and latent energy totals together. And as I mentioned before, the usable energy is the latent energy. And the sensible energy, the 180 BTUs in this particular case, would be what is left in the condensate once the pound of steam gives up its latent heat, that content of which we added 970 BTUs. Now, you notice I had two different feed water temperatures in the previous two examples, and, and the reason I did that is for two reasons, actually. First, to advise that most steam tables start at 32 degrees Fahrenheit and zero PSIG, and then increase in pressure from there to show what the sensible and latent heat content is at the pressure as the pressure increases. But the next thing I, I wanted to, to make clear to you also is, is the impact of the feed water temperature on the boiler's output, keeping in mind that all boiler manufacturers catalog or rate their boiler output starting at 100% firing rate, full capacity, zero gauge pressure, and 212 degree Fahrenheit feed water temperature. Now, following that criteria, you see at zero gauge and 212 degrees, the border produces 34.5 pounds of steam per hour, which is considered one boiler horsepower, 34.5. Then as the pressure increases above zero gauge, the output drops off slightly. But if we lower the feed water temperature from 212 to, let's say, 100 degrees Fahrenheit, Look at the difference at zero gauge pressure. We went from 34.5, one boiler horsepower, to 30.9 pounds of steam per hour. We've lost about four pounds. So feed water temperature and to some extent operating pressure have a definite impact on the boiler's output. 
So engineers need to keep this in mind when sizing a boiler for a particular load. And also be mindful, for every 10 degree drop in feed water temperature, you lose about 1% in boiler efficiency. In other words, the burner on the boiler has to try to make up this deficit. And that's why it is so important to return condensate as hot as possible for the boiler's use. Or it may not meet the load conditions at that particular time. OK, so we've talked about the first and second laws of thermodynamics. We've talked about sensible and latent energy and creating a pound of steam. Now let's talk about how this heat is transmitted in a boiler to make steam in a process application or hot water in a comfort heating situation. And as you can see on the slide, there are three ways this almost simultaneously happens in a boiler. It happens radiantly, conductively, and convectively. And if we are talking about heat exchangers, which are transferring energy from one steam or hot water uh, medium to another, there are only two methods going on. And they are convection and conduction. So let me explain these methods in a, in a bit more detail. Going back to the water tube boiler, you see the combustion chamber, also referred to as the furnace. And it is here where the radiant heat energy from the flame is absorbed. In other words, any heating surface which sees flame is radiant surface. And it has a delta T to the power of 4 over any other heating surface because of the significant temperature difference between the flame temperature in the furnace, which is over 2,000 degrees, and the temperature of the water being heated in the boiler. And it is this large delta T which promotes excellent heat transfer and is why many modern boiler designs today take advantage of this and are releasing more BTUs in the furnace as opposed to the convection section thereby reducing the overall size of the boiler, its footprint, without compromising the integrity of the vessel. Uh, to give you a, a better perspective, here's a look inside a commercial water tube boiler showing the relative size of the furnace and where the radiant energy is transferred to the surrounding vertical water tubes coming out of the lower mud drum. Then we have the fire tube boiler furnace where the radiant energy is released to the water surrounding it. And you see the tubes, which are also surrounded by water, within a common shell. Here, let, let me show you more specifically what I mean. Here you see a fire tube shell. It's in the background. Tube sheets stacked in between it, and then the finished shell in the foreground. Remember, there are two tube sheets. One in the front, which is what you see, and then there's also one in the rear. The tubes and the furnace are attached to these, and the water in the shell surrounds them. That is why we call them fire tubes, because the flame and hot gases are in the tubes, whereas with a water tube, it's just the opposite. OK, so much for the radiant heat transfer. Now let's talk about or consider what conductive heat transfer is. Looking at the slide now on the screen, you see two types of fire tubes. One is plain on the left, and the other is extended surface, also known as fins. Conductive heat transfer occurs across the tube wall and is promoted again by the delta T and the convective forces caused by the velocity of the gas passing through the tube in conjunction with the resultant turbulence measured in engineering terms as a Reynolds number, the ratio of inertia to viscous forces. And when speaking of velocity and turbulent action, that is what is referred to as convective action, which not only occurs on the fire side, but the water side too as the water thermally circulates, pulling the BTUs through the tube wall and transferring them to the water on the other side of the tube, the water of which will ultimately turn to steam or much hotter water in terms of a hot water heating boiler. The fins or extended surfaces in the tube on the right will significantly add to the convective action raising the heat transfer coefficient per linear foot. Proportionally, the heat transfer coefficient, of 
course, is the proportionality between the amount of heat transferred per unit area and the delta T.